To see exclusive bonus footage of this interview, sign up and become a member at patreon.com forward slash original gangsters. Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my uh, home studio with my partner in crime, Scott Bernstein. Hey now, sorry, that's Chunky uh, saying hello too. That's my bulldog. Very protective of me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks everyone for uh, for tuning in, for listening, for watching, and I uh, want to remind everyone, please, if you like the channel, please subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, and also please. Um, uh, subscribe to our audio channel follow us on social media uh we're super excited about our episode today we have uh, our uh, returning champion deborah Bonello, who's who's been on our podcast before and um she is the author of narcas that's something that we talked about uh, when when deborah was on last time the secret R- rise of women in latin america's cartels um i highly recommend this this text you can watch our other uh video or listen to the audio to find out more about this book um deborah was uh editorial director for um uh vice at one point but now she is affiliated with insight crime with which is another outstanding website i encourage my students when they're doing their research papers to consult insight crime as um as a, as a source for information on on cartels so we wanted to bring uh, Deborah on uh, to discuss what's in the news right now with the recent arrests of El Mayo Zambada and Joaquin Guzman Lopez, two major cartel figures. So, um, welcome, Deborah. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. Yeah, thank you. So, A lot of news in your neck of the woods. She's just <laughs> to preview that people don't don't know. She's in. You know, she's at ground zero. She's in Mexico City. Mexico is the is the country that just keeps on giving when it yeah. comes to news. I can't complain. Um, yeah, right. You you are in the center of it now. Um, so for our audience who's unfamiliar with before we get into the arrest and the, the subsequent like sort of fallout of what this means um in terms of policy and, and within within the, the the drug cartels, um, can you give us a, like a brief a, you know, biographical sketch of, of who, like El Mayo, um, Joaquin Guzman Lopez. Why, why is this a big deal? Who are these two individuals? So I'd say, you know, El Mayo and El Chapo, before he was finally extradited, I think it was in 20, 2017, 2018, they're kind of like the sort of last old school, old G um, cartel leaders left in Mexico, you know. El Mayo was 76 years old when he got flown to to uh, the U.S. in July against his will. I mean, he's been in the in the drug trade for the last at least sort of five decades, I would say. And um, El Chapo, who was 60, who is 67 today, um, the same. You know, he'd spent most of his adult life in the drug trade. So, so, so what we're seeing here, you know, is the the, the founders of the Sinaloa cartel, which of course you know, came out of the Guadalajara cartel, which was sort of the first original Mexican cartel. They're kind of, the, they are like the OGs, the remaining OGs of, of the Mexican drug trafficking business. And so with them goes a certain era, goes a certain set of sort of old school codes and traditions. And, you know, even though, you know, the the, the narrative of, of the drug trafficking trade, especially from US law enforcement, is kind of very good guys, bad guys, the the role of, of of sort of drug trafficking culture and history in Latin America is very rich and like has a lot of sort of fans and followers. You know, to some people, you know, you can see the statue behind me. Chapo has been immortalized in in Culiacan by by uh, fans of his, and like people go to a dedicated chapel um, to buy you know tap souvenir tap that's devoted to to drug traffickers. So. You know, it's it's really much more complex and widespread than just, you know, we're, we're putting these big bad guys behind bars. To a lot of people, both El Mayo and Chapo represent this sort of rag to riches stories. You know, people born in grinding poverty in, in rural Sinaloa and then like have kind of risen to the top of the chain to feature on the Forbes list as, as our friend um, Chapo did. So so the sort of the, the legend and the sort of weight and, and like, OG status of both men can't be can't be overstated. Okay, so 
Um, El Mayo, so is it safe or is it accurate to say that he was El Chapo's number two or is that more complicated in terms of like an organizational chart? My understanding was they were co-founders and co-directors. But for some time, power within the Sinaloa cartel had been splintering, um, especially when El Chapo was finally taken to the U.S. You know, whilst he was in Mexico and imprisoned many times, as we all know, he was still sort of considered to be in the game because Mexican prisons are very porous. Um, there was always the promise that he would get out, which he did, um, and, you know. And so when he finally got taken to the U.S., that was kind of him out of the game. Um, but up until then, um, him and Elmira had been sort of at the top of the Sinaloa Cartel as kind of co-founders, co-directors, but, but running, running and managing different factions, factions, factions which now Chapo's sons, Los Chapitos, have sort of taken the reins of his part of the cartel and El Mayo's um, associates have taken control of his. So you've got, Las, you know, Las Maizas, who are Mayo's part, and Los Chapitos, who represent the, the, the Chapito faction. Um, and, you know, you have to, like, when we talk about cartels, we're not talking about corporations. You know, we're really talking about sort of brands and franchises now. So, you know, a recent study, in fact, that Insight Crime did that I wasn't involved in about the, the whole kind of fentanyl and, and precursor production chain in Mexico. There are so many sort of independent brokers and sales involved that, you know, may be loosely affiliated with the Sinaloa cartel, but like so many sort of, you know, ants working separately to, to import and cook and package and transport fentanyl, all of which is just sort of happening under this umbrella brand of the Sinaloa cartel. But it's, it's so disparate, it's so fractured that I'm not sure that control constituted, you know, picking up a phone and saying, okay, so everyone stop doing this and start doing that. I think, I think it was too fractured for things by the time both Chapel and Mayo got 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 taken into custody. And so what was the, do we know what the relationship was like between Zambada and, and El Chapo's sons? Uh, because my understanding is now it's like a, a rivalry, which is yeah. kind of interesting. The fact that they were captured together, which, which we can talk about in a moment, but um, do you have any, any, any idea like what, what the sense of the relationship was between those two or were they kind of like, to your point of like, they're just doing different things, different factions. I mean, I mean, Clearly, there was a relationship and a familial relationship. It's probable that El Mayo has known all of El Chapo's sons since the day they were born because they were both close associates with each other and, you know, began as friends. And then, you know, the whole of their sort of empire just sort of expanded more than they probably had initially imagined. So sure, I'm sure there were sort of familial ties and like, you know, a legacy of a relationship between those those two groups. You know, El Mayo is significantly older than the, than the Chapitos. But of course, they come from very different generations. And like, you know, when you talk to people who chronicle the, the sort of narco wars in, in Sinaloa, the Chapitos represent this kind of new, uh, new brand of, you know, um, slightly more entitled drug trafficker. All of Chapel's sons were born into great wealth, of course, because by the time they came into the business, their dad had already set up this massive organization. They were already super privileged and had a lot of disposable income, not to mention social capital and cultural and political power. So they weren't starting from where their dad was starting. They didn't have to climb their way all the way up. The same can be said for Vicentillo, which is uh, El Mayo's son, who's been in custody for some time and, you know, cooperated with law enforcement and what have you. So I think, you know, they've known each other. They've all, they've probably known each other all their lives. I do, I do understand that once Chapel was taken out of the game, there was a lot of violence between Mayo's faction and Los Chapitos factions, probably at the end of the day, you know, and it has always been the case in, in, in organized crime. Killing and violence is, is, is sort of the currency that keeps people in power, right? And if it means for the Chapitos, if that means getting rid of El Mayo, they'll get, they'll get rid of him and vice versa. But, you know, that never happened. And, like, I think it is fascinating that El Mayo, you know, lived 76 years without seeing the inside of a jail cell, um, whereas the Chapitos are getting picked off by law enforcement in their, you know, I think of videos in his early 30s, you know, the, the guy they arrested 
it was either last year or the year before the second time around. Um, so I think ultimately there's a, you know, there's a lot of like love and blood between them, but that when it comes down to it, it's, it's about power. And I think we saw that when, when Chapel was extradited. Well, what's happening now, I think is people are holding their breath in, in Sinaloa because I think when Chapel was extradited, there was a huge amount of, of violence that took place within Sinaloa as there was this kind of jostling for power um, the, with those different factions in place. Now with El Mayo out of the picture, the question is, you know, only one of his sons now remains um, sort of in circulation in Sinaloa, and he's sort of the obvious successor to Mayo. So um, there is a lot of speculation about what's going to come next. Yeah. Can you also, I mean, you've, 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 we're addressing this in a way in terms of like their different backgrounds, um, social economic backgrounds, but like the contrast in style, is it, is it correct to say that El Mayo was more understated and the Los Chapitos are much more like conspicuous? So can you, can you talk about like a contrast in, in styles between the two leaderships? I mean, you know, Mayo is one of those rare breeds, much like myself, who remembers a time before the internet existed. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the narco culture before the birth of the internet was very different to what it is now. You know, it was kind of old school, you know, almost cowboy fashion and like cowboy boots and hats. And, you know, you go, you, you would go to Culiacan in those times and everyone kind of looked like a narco, even if they weren't one. And now like we've moved into this kind of, you know, the social media pushing of, of, of narco culture. You've got, you know, associations with Peso Pluma and other really kind of high profile artists who have been you know, legitimately or not connected to, uh, you know, the the sort of annals of, of drug trafficking stars. And like, he sings a lot about um, members of different cartels in his songs, you know, and it's all about bling and cars and women and plastic surgery. And like, so narco culture and like the way that those two different generations present themselves has has shifted enormously. And I think a lot of that is to do with the internet and like this kind of, you know, capitalism on steroids that we're seeing where, you know, success is really about like what brands you're buying and how much cash you have and, and less to do perhaps with who you're controlling and how many people respect you. And, you know, the, one, of the, one of the writers from Rio Dosso, which is a newspaper that has been chronicling Culiacan for decades, said that, you know, um, people from Sinaloa, you know, respected and respected and admired the likes of El Mayo and Chapo, but they respect, but, but they don't, they don't respect, but they fear his sons. You know, there's not that same sort of um, camaraderie or familial love or like belonging, I think, that the old school traficantes had. That's my feeling. But, but essentially the Chapitos are perceived as like, you know, entitled millennials, you know, who've come from a very different, way of seeing things and they represent with those sort of uh capitalist badges of honor which i think were just like not around when el mayo was 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 sort of coming up i mean there are like two photos of el mayo in circulation maybe three and one of them is the one that went around when he was uh flown into the united states in mid-july the man just doesn't have a sort of high profile public image unlike chapo's sons you know who are all over the place. So I think that best sort of does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting. Um, this kind of contrast between the old school, like um, millennials versus the old, the last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're, like the traditional idea is that you do keep a low, if you are a boss, you, you keep a low profile and don't draw attention to yourself and uh, in some ways be more modest at least and, and because it because it's really about power it's not about conspicuous consumption and being flashy and uh and that seems to be quite a contrast to to the to the younger and it i don't think it's it. just the cartels i think you see this with the italians with black <laughs> gangsters and the, the other point i'd make actually about it is you know after mayo and chapo sort of rose to the to the sort of heights of the Sinaloa cartel. You then had the Setas in the late 1990s and early 2000s who really created a race, a, a, an arms race. And so the, um, you know, the, the kind of caliber of weapons and the type of weapons that were being used, weapons which are sort of part of this 
public image of the cartels. You know, you you you, you go onto go, you go onto YouTube and you'll find a ton of videos from both the Sinaloa, but mainly the Jalisco cartel, actually brandishing, you know, barrets and and like you know military weaponry. That that kind of arms race was created by the the Cetas cartel in the late 1990s and 2000s. And that also changed the culture around the cartels. And like it, it created an arms race for weaponry and it created a race to the bottom in terms of the type of violence that was that started being used in the cartel wars. So you had, you know, um, heads being thrown onto dance floors. You had bodies hanging from bridges. Like that kind of stuff was, 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 was rare, unusual, infrequent. When, uh, when the old school leadership was in charge. And then, you know, as younger and younger uh, capitals started coming into the business, all of that started to change, you know? Yeah, we, we, yeah, go ahead, Scott, jump in. Go ahead. Well, I just, would it, wouldn't it be accurate or I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to say something that is obvious and then make fun of people that aren't recognizing that it's obvious. So I, I want to, couch that or um, preface it with this but you know the i don't consider myself a, a cartel expert so i'm more of an uh educated observer i guess as opposed to a lot of the other material that's on our uh pod so i just i obviously defer to you and and i would even defer to jimmy with a lot of this stuff as well but doesn't this what we're what i'm hearing from you and what i've read the amount that i've read that the Chapitos are kind of modeling their father's behavior. I mean, El Chapo kind of came from, again, tell me if, uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but kind of came from that, um, not lineage in, this, in the sense of bloodline, but lineage in the, in the sense of like, he saw, even though it was a different part of the world, I mean, that's, he was Pablo after Pablo, mm -hmm. and he kind of like, took some pages out of the Pablo book to become El Chapo and then supersized it. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. lived and lived a very ostentatious existence. So it's not crazy to think that not only are there not only are these millennials, but they're coming from that stock. Absolutely. But I think the drug trade has changed enormously since El Mayo and El Chapo came up. There are way more people in the game synthetic drugs are now kind of the, the the business and financial priority of the cartels and the production process for that is very different you know you're not relying on impoverished uh peasants who are growing weed and, and heroin poppy and like you're buying their pace and like, you're not relying on that anymore you're, you're you're bringing in your chemicals from china like industrialized yeah it's industrialized and it's also because 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 there are now so many other players in the game Leadership has to be way more aggressive. You know, I suppose if you look at the way that corporations were run in the 1950s and 60s and you look at how corporations are run now, it's a very different style of leadership. I think it's much more aggressive. I think you have to be much more sort of on top of things and in contact with people. You can't afford to be isolated and, you know, stuffed away in the hills too much. You know, when, when, they, when they grabbed a video, you know, he was living in a town with a massive mansion and the you know, a bunch of flashy cars, like everyone knew he was there. And that was kind of, you know, part of his social capital, I think. So yes, they are inheriting the power from their father and they are kind of building on his legacy, but they also didn't have to work too hard to get that power because they were born into it. So I would argue the entitled uh, adjective that has been used to describe them is probably accurate in the sense that they don't really know what it's like to sort of grapple their way up the way that their fathers did because they were already given such a head start. That's not to say they haven't taken leadership leaves out of their father's books, but I don't know whether you saw that that stuff when Rolling Stone interviewed um, El Chapo after. Do you remember Sean Penn? Well, Sean Penn, I mean, wasn't so, that, so, so, tell me honestly, if I'm wrong here, but wasn't that part of his downfall and his capture that he let his vanity and his desire to meet Sean Penn kind of Absolutely. expose but, him. But, you, know, you saw him talk because he said, I think Penn didn't take any video. And then in the end, someone took a, took a phone video of Chapo answering some questions. And like, you know, he was wearing this like really nasty silk shirt and like, 
even the way he spoke, like there was nothing. If, if you put him next to his sons, you'd see the typical generational differences that you would if, if I was next to my dad or your, you next to yours. You know, it's like those generational differences. Yes, you take on what you need and you and you learn and, and you inherit. But like then you, you add your own particular spin. And a lot of the spin that you add is kind of determined by the environment in which you're working. And I think the Chapitos are working in a much more crowded environment than they were than their fathers were. And also in a world where like surveillance is easier, you know, the internet has just like- Omni, I would say it's not just easier, I'd say it's omnipresent. It's omnipresent yeah. and it's made, it's, made everything, it's made everything so much more visible. You know, remember when they tried to arrest or video one of Chapel's sons the first time around and they messed it up. Like within minutes of that conflict starting to take place, me and my colleagues were seeing photos on social media, getting photos sent to us from Culiacan of, you know, 22 year old kids driving around Culiacan with, with Barrett's essentially cartel henchmen um, rallying to sort of rebuff government troops. And like that was, you know, if, if that was happening back in the 80s, you know, you, maybe you would hear about it the next day. But like news just didn't travel that fast. You know, it was it was much more kind of I suppose that was much more it was much easier to go under the radar than it is now, I think. And, and as you know, like the, the battle for hearts and minds now is being won online. I mean, social media has been so fundamental to the outreach of the cartels and like the, the sort of proliferation of narco culture. Should we, should we have uh, uh, just a breakdown of what happened a couple of weeks ago? Just so for the audience that might not know or haven't followed the headlines, uh, Deborah, can you just give us like, the, the bullet points of the arrest of uh, El Mayo, which is pretty, you know, huge in the in the news that we cover here. I mean, it, yeah. he's a, a Capone like Gotti like figure for people that are maybe aren't as familiar with sure. the cartels. I mean, and then uh, El, the Chapitos were with him, which is a little strange. And now there are allegations from El Mayo to, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, claiming that he got set up. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of surprising to imagine El Mayo and uh, Joaquin Lopez Guzman in the same room together because they do work for rival factions of the same cartel, and lots of lots of animosity and bad blood has passed between those families, right? So that's the first thing that's like, what are they doing on the plane together? But El Mayo, the OG, the the the, the probably the last OG of of the of Mexican drug trafficking. Um, was flown to the United States on a private plane, the same private plane as Joaquin Guzman Lopez, who is um, one of uh, one of El Chapo's sons. The story goes that Joaquin managed to convince El Mayo that they were going to a meeting with a number of important local politicians. That's how he got him on the plane. But then once he was on the plane, the plane just carried on going and flew over the US-Mexico border. And before he knows it, um, he's on the other side in in in, uh, in American territory, and I mean you can see from some of the photo from the the only photo in fact of of El Mayo once he was put in a in a police car he he did not expect to be there you know and it 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 took some sort of you know <laughs> balls I guess is the only word for it on the part of of uh, of Joaquin to sort of crack that deal. And he also, of course, as part of that process, he handed himself in. Now, for me, I can see why El Mayo would hand himself in because he's old. He's, he's reportedly had bad health for the last few decades. He's done, man. I mean, he's 76. He lives in the middle of, you know, nowhere in Sinaloa. He's constantly having to move around. Like his, his, his golden days in the drug trade are gone. Joaquin arguably had decades ahead of him to like, you know, become a legend, just like his father and and like his other brothers wanted to. So, so it's it's perplexing to me why he would hand himself in. Probably the DEA talked him into you know offering some sort of deal for him and Ovidio, who's already in custody. But it, all of that is really just speculation at this point. But th th that's the ABC of what happened. Okay. Yeah. So, um, th do you think that you know there there are um... I don't know. I, I, I hate to use the term conspiracy theory because then it automatically seems like 
kind of kooky. But this is something I talked about with um, Noah uh, Horowitz, who who wrote the the I don't know if you know him, Deborah, but he wrote the auto or the biography of El Chapo, and um, I mean we know El Chapo was giving information to the, to the DEA. DEA, so I mean it's not conspiracy theory, and that's, um, that's in court filing. Just for people to just for the audience to understand, yeah, that came out in federal court filings uh, in the United States that from way and not not at the end of his reign but from early in his reign El Chapo was trading information with the DEA. I mean I think that is probably standard practice by most drug capos that there is an ongoing exchange of information. I would agree. You know, you have you have so many important drug traffickers sitting in American prisons also who are constantly whispering in the ears of prosecutors and people making constructing legal cases against you know people who are still like operating in Mexico, right? So it, it, you know, and, and there has been throughout the years. One of El Chapo's son was killed. Then they went. Then they thought that the uh, the Beltran labor cartel had had sold him out to, to law enforcement. But then a, a war started with the Beltran labor. Historically, law enforcement and organized crimes relationship with it has helped to kind of stir the pot and all these animosities and arrests and, and murders that we've seen. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that Elmira was also having a conversation. I've seen reporting that Elmira was also having a conversation with DEA and has been for many years. I guess they just didn't offer him what he wanted when he wanted it. And that's why, you know, unless, you know, the other thing is you really have to like take with a pinch of salt all the accounts of these things because it's really hard to like get to like what really is the golden true nugget of what happened. It could, you know, El Mayo published a letter after he was arrested. Via That's what I, right, I read that. That's part of where my knowledge was coming from. Really, right. and and some of his account of what happened that night contradicts what the state the state prosecutor said about what happened that night. And this, the state prosecutor has since resigned. You know, and so. Heads, heads, are, heads are falling all over the place, you know, when someone like this gets taken into, gets taken into custody. And, and, and it's, it's also, you know, Andres Manuel, Mexico's president, said he knew nothing about any of this at all, um, which sort of in, in, in one way beggars belief, but in the other way, you know, Mexico's bilateral security relationship with, Mexico, with the U.S. has been terrible for quite a few years since they arrested the former defense chief in uh when he was on holiday in, in LA or Miami I forget so um yeah I mean I, I think these conversations are going on all the time and I think you know when you look at the fact of how old Elmire was and he got he had never been arrested by Mexican law enforcement you can't blame the Americans for just getting exasperated and and forging their own way into bringing him in because they clearly have not been given the help they required from the Mexican side. Well, that's what, that's where I was going with the kind of conspiracy theory. I hate to use that term again, but the fact that El Mayo was untouched for so long seems suspicious. Interesting to me, if, if not suspicious, <laughs> interesting to me. And so, uh, you know, we, we're speculating, but um, that that does seem intriguing to me that. You know, I, 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 Deborah, tell me if you think I'm wrong, and I, I'm speaking from a more traditional uh, American organized crime perspective. But I, I'm guessing that it it trans transfers to to the narco's world. You know, with guys that live in a world like that, to be able to go not years but decades and decades avoiding any problems with law enforcement i may be back at a, at a certain time but I, I just don't see how it's possible in, in modern um in modern times how you could do that and not there not be some type of something some type of deal struck somewhere are you in Insinuating that the Mexican Justice Institution <laughs> right. has been corrupted or, or, and co-opted by right. organized crime. Right. I mean, I don't think that's any secret. We've just seen the, the 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 conviction of Mexico's former public security chief, General Garcia Luna in the US, for 
you know, cult collaborating with the cartels and passing them information. Like, absolutely. It's, 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 a, it's both kind of, uh, I mean, it's not surprising to me because I've been here 20 years, but like, it is a, a terrible truth that you get used to, which is the fact that they do largely remain untouched by Mexican law enforcement, unless the Americans insist. My, my feeling is that as the fentanyl opioid epidemic in the US, as the opioid epidemic, you know, beginning with uh, prescription painkillers and heroin and now fentanyl, as that has become harder to ignore, the DEA has put the fentanyl narrative on the chapitos, firm and square on their, on their shoulders. So the idea that the American public has, the American public which votes for the American president, um, is that it's the Chapitas who are singularly responsible for the fentanyl crisis, which is killing, you know, white middle class kids. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that that has made Mexico's, the pressure on Mexico to act heavier, which is probably why you saw the arrest of um, as well, uh, Carol Quintero, I, I, I can't remember, he, they, he was recaptured a few, a few years ago, uh, the original, you know, Marijuana King, um, and, and Obidio and Nada Chapitos. Um, and so, you know, depending on those sort of drug trends and geopolitical relationships and bilateral relationships, um, Mexico's government does come under more, more strain, but it's, it's so infiltrated you know, the reason why the Sinaloa cartel descended into infighting when Chapo got extradited was because in a U.S. prison, people know he's never coming back. But as long as he was in Mexico, he had access to other cartel members. He was active in the cartel, even if he was sitting in a Mexican prison cell. And it was a completely different situation. He escaped from prison, um, I believe it was the, twice, right? And then the third time they caught him and extradited him, um, which, which speaks volumes about how porous Mexico's penitentiaries are and how seriously you can take its justice institutions. Now, every president that comes in says they're going to clean things up, things are going to get better. You've seen this militarization of Mexico's drug war since I arrived in 2006. Has it improved anything? I mean, I think extraditions have risen extraditions to the U.S., but the, the U.S. does generally outsource, the, Mexico does generally outsource its justice process to the Americans. Yeah. I mean, you even see that comment, I mean, from the the president saying, you know, I, I didn't, as you mentioned, I didn't know about this. Like, um, you know, don't blame me <laughs> for, for these guys being extradited. I mean, either that's true. It could be true. But it's also like, it's such a damning indictment of like, well, why didn't you know? I mean, this guy is like, right. you know, the equivalent of Mexico's Al Capone. Like, how could you not know? Like, I, I find it very hard to believe that he didn't know that that was taking place. And there are all sorts of local political reasons and his relationship with, with um, the powers that be. And his his relationship with the military on who he behave on who he depends wholeheartedly for public security in Mexico. But I'd be gobsmacked if that was true. And yeah. the audacity and and also the audacity of the Americans to mount something like that or broker something like that without the cooperation of U.S. law enforcement. When you know when they arrested Cienfuegos, the former defense chief in America, I think it was. Was just it was just when AMLO had taken power, or maybe when when Trump was at, was on his way out. It was it was when when things were crossing over. Oh, AMLO was in power because AMLO threatened to throw the DEA out of Mexico if they did that, right? Yeah. And like the U.S. would be completely shafted if the DEA could not operate in Mexico. So they dropped the charges, sent Cienfuegos home. It was unprecedented. So it is weird that the DEA would kind of do that again, you know without Mexico's knowledge. It just doesn't make any sense to me, unless they're just depending on the fact that AMLO's about to leave power. Sorry, this is a bit in the weeds in terms no, of- No, it's fine. It's good. But you know what I mean? I'm like, why yeah. would you go and do that again? Like, you know, Shenbaum, who's going to replace AMLO, is, 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 is very much a left winger, not a, not a populist like, like AMLO is. So she, she might choose to be even harder on the DEA if they keep putting that stuff. Who knows? Yeah, um, yeah, the kind of like anti-imperialist kind of 
that Very plays much. well with with that with that um, constituency. Mm-hmm. Um, so, with the Chapitos, and you, you were talking about the 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 opioid addiction crisis. Um, for like, a, wasn't it like a public relations thing? Didn't the Chapitos like make an announcement that they weren't going to traffic uh, like fentanyl to the U.S.? Well, do you remember the the Justice Department issued a new issued a fresh indictment against the Chapitos? I want to say it happened last year, maybe the year before. They were talking about them testing fentanyl on uh, human guinea pigs. They were alleging that the Chapitos were feeding rivals and and traitors to tigers, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. after that happened, again, who 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 knows, you know, but like there's so many people in American custody now who've been around the Chapitos that there's a lot of people to feed them the kind of information. After that indictment was issued, um, the Chapitos did sort of put a break on fentanyl production in Sinaloa for a few months um, because I think there was this general sort of tension and fear that that indictment would precipitate a high profile arrest. But um, I think outside, you know, it's not just the Sinaloa cartel that's producing fentanyl. There's the, the Jalisco new generation cartel. And I don't think any, any one person in Sinaloa has the capacity or the power to pick up a phone and say, everyone stop cooking fentanyl and meth. I think the cartel landscape is way too fractured for that now. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of, um, this narrative that you get from the U.S. that the Chapitos are the, you know, single-handedly responsible for the fentanyl crisis. I, I, I mean, I just don't think that's true. As you it's point out, it's too simplistic. simplistic. Yeah, yeah, the other, the other cartel groups are are also into it, and and then even within those cartels, as you mentioned, there's, you know, it's very diffuse. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that that that, that makes sense to me. The, the the steps of making fentanyl are really substantial. You know, I'll, I'll I mean, for your own background, I'll send you a, a report that Insight Crime did on on this. When you look at the the kind of quantity of people in the chain, how they source the precursors or the ingredients for precursors, how they bring them into Mexico, all that is a very complex um, process that requires you know getting stuff into Mexican ports, getting out of containers, you know, before you, and, and, you know, after you've done the deal with China or India or or the Netherlands or wherever these chemicals are coming from, like there are so many steps in the chain and so many sort of independent brokers and actors in, in that the idea that it's just the Sinaloa cartel, you know, and, 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 you know, we know that the drug trade is really a visceral representation of like capitalism at its worst, right? Which is, the pharmaceutical companies blew the lid off the opioid, the opioid crisis in the U.S. And Americans or people in America started demanding fentanyl and demanding yeah. something they could buy on the streets that was replacing what their doctors were then saying no to. So, you know, again, this narrative that like, you know, poor brown people in cartels are pushing, you know, <laughs> deadly opioids onto white middle class kids in, in America. It's so simplistic. and mm-hmm. like absolutely like justifies the drug war but it's not it's not it doesn't go any way to explaining how complex the they want they um, not to get into a whole soap opera but i have been around some people in recent years that are uh addicts and they're pretty forthright with their desire to seek out fentanyl in their mind, they know the good fentanyl and the bad fentanyl. And in their mind, they want to take it to the point where they're near death. That's like, that's a high in itself. It is. It is. And I, I think I think there's a complexity to the way that fentanyl has changed opioid consumption in the U.S. My understanding is that heroin is sort of, it's not disappeared, but it's on the way out. And the opioid addicts are asking for fentanyl. You know, heroin was kind of a Trojan horse for it after the, the, the sort of doctors stopped, stopped being so free and easy with their prescription, with their painkiller prescriptions. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, you guys know this. The the, the whole kind of dynamic of of uh, victim and victimizer, and like Mexico and the US, and like the tr- drug traffickers and drug takers. It's all it's it's all very simplistic, and like the supply and demand dynamics that we see all around us are, 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 are just represented there. You know, that the cartels are going to keep giving Americans what they want, not just Americans, like, and to move away from fentanyl slightly, but cocaine is also like, you'd think it's kind of out of fashion, but it's, it's booming. And in oh, Europe, it's, Europe, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, Europe's just in my study. Cocaine right now, you know, it's exploded over there, cocaine use. I, I don't really, I mean, I think there have been some relative ebbs and flows over the years, but I would say for the last 40 years, 50, 45 years, there's been a boom in the cocaine market that has really, it might have dipped a, a couple times, small dips, but it's pretty consistent. In it terms is. Of people it is. want coke to party with. No and matter I where you it. are, no matter what sphere of society, no matter what country, a lot of times it's... Yeah, and, and now you're seeing synthetic cocaine. You know, like the big difference between, for me, like drugs like fentanyl and cocaine, you know, cocaine and like... um uh, weed and like uh, you know these are sort of party drugs if you yeah, like. but right. stuff like fentanyl is 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 appealing to a very different type of yes. customer if you like. Um, but the, the 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 cartels are very agile, and when they see a business opportunity, they take it, and that is that is what that is what they have done. Um, and if the pharmaceutical companies weren't that bothered about addiction and and uh, <laughs> what what those kinds of pills were going to provoke in the American population, then why would you expect the cartels to be? You know, there's that great scene in Ozark where, you know, the person who's probably modeled around Chapo's son meets like the person who works for the Sackler family and shakes her hand and says, it's nice to meet someone who's killed more Americans than we have. Yeah. Uh, Bernie, any last thoughts as as we wrap up? This was great. I want to just tell everyone that I hope that we can, provide more cartel coverage and and because this is i mean jimmy and i were talking off uh off air i mean it's not to disparage what we're doing it's not to disparage you know traditional american organized crime but this is at a whole other level uh and it needs attention from people you know for, now it doesn't i mean there's a lot of attention being being placed on there's a lot of media coverage but I want, and I know Jimmy wants to incorporate into our brand a little bit more of the cartel coverage because it's so historically significant and and compelling and riveting. And people like you help us tell those stories. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's mention again, Narcos, please go out and, and buy this book, read this book. Uh, I'm going to assign it to my students uh, next semester uh, in my gangs and organized crime class. <laughs> So, uh, Deborah, I mean, what, and I mean, you mentioned Insight Crime. I mean, what's going on with you? You want to, you know, shout out anything where people can find out, you know, more of your writing and and other appearances? Uh, I'm running a Substack right now, which you can find if you you Google me on online or you go to Substack. Um, working on some podcasts and documentary ideas that are backed by the book. Um, and yeah, you know, writing a book, it's, it, it, it took a lot out, took a lot out of me. So I'm sort of <laughs> coasting for a little bit and figuring out whether I want to write. No shame. No shame. I haven't, no, published, I'm kind of, I'm I haven't actually, published a book in the decade. I'm actually really interested right now in psychedelics and like, you know, Mexico is home to a lot of the psychedelic, the psychedelic medicines as they're called. Um, you're seeing calls for legalization of psilocybin and other, other substances. So kind of looking into something a little less cartelly because the cartels don't really care about psychedelics for some reason um and a little bit more kind of drug culture but um haven't quite figured it out yet i'll keep you posted okay well sounds cool uh deborah bonello thanks again Thank so uh much, be, be safe out there we appreciate your time and thanks everyone for listening and watching i'm jimmy bucciolato we're out 